When Aaron Rodgers took over for Brett Favre in 2008, he was taking over a 13-3 and team, a team that had just been to the NFC Championship game. Think if Jordan Love had taken over in 2021, or even I think it would be fair to say 2022, despite the Packers' inglorious exit in the divisional round in the 2021 season. So how does this year's team compare to that 2018 and how does the situation that Aaron Rodgers inherited relative to what Brett Favre have compare in this case that is on today's show you are locked on Packers your daily Green Bay Packers podcast part of the locked on podcast network your team every day You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski, and I cover the Packers for The Leap, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked On Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet. And the show for fans who know what happened, they want to know why and how. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. Today's episode brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get a no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's FanDuel.com slash Locked On for that no sweat first bet. So I've gotten this question a number of times. How does the 2023 Packers compare to the 2008 Packers? And this is an interesting question. I think it's a difficult question because it's also a different league. The CBA is different. The way teams practice is different. The way the game is played is different. Though 2007 really started a trend it was the Patriots spread out offense going 18 and one. It was the Packers going 13 and three. They went five wide for like the only time in Aaron Rodgers, or excuse me, Brett Favre's career in 2007. They could go truly five wide receivers. And the game was starting to spread out in ways that it didn't for most of Brett Favre's career, running that traditional West Coast offense where you always had a tight end on the field. You often had a fullback on the field. Maybe you had two tight ends on the field. It was just, it was a more condensed set of personnel. And interestingly, we're, we're kind of going back to that place where teams want to play bigger. They want to play with two running backs. They want to play with two tight ends. But so that makes it a little difficult to compare era to era. Before we do the 2023 Packers compared to the 2008 Packers, I'm going to point something out. Aaron Rodgers, 2018, is almost player for player the Aaron Rodgers, 2017. So you talk about a 13 and three team that goes six and 10 with the exact same players, but a different quarterback, but a different. Quarterback. So you have to conclude it was all Aaron Rodgers, right? Well, the passing offense went from 7th in DVOA to 8th. The defense actually got better in the aggregate from 16th to 13th. The, the passing defense with Charles Woodson and Al Harris and Nick Collins, they were 7th in 2008. Same personnel, but they went to 27th. Against the run, they lost Colin Jenkins for that season. I, I looked at these two teams and I remembered it was pretty close. I didn't remember it was basically identical. I mean, Greg Jennings, Donald Driver, James Jones as your top receivers, all there. Chad Clifton and Mark Tauscher, your starting offensive tackles. Scott Wells, your center. Jason Spitz starting at one guard. Actually, Aaron Rodgers upgraded. His offensive line, because Junius Costin had to play a lot of 2007. Alan Barber had to play. Tony Maul had to play. And the Packers got 
during college. Aaron Rodgers did. The running back room is the same. It's Corey Hall and Ryan Grant with Brandon Jackson and that group. And it's Donald Lee. Now, Bubba Franks was not on that 2008 team, but Donald Lee was the starter. It's the same offensive personnel. It's the same group. It's the same group. So it's not surprising that they didn't actually change that much offensively. Now, they did fall overall. They went from fifth in DVOA in 2007 to 11th with Aaron Rodgers. A lot of that had to do with the running game not being as good, and they just they just weren't as good situationally. That's going to be the case for the Packers in 2023. Now, on defense, it is also almost player for player. The big difference is Corey Williams, and that was supposed to be a prize offseason acquisition. He did nothing outside of Green Bay. Still Aaron Campman in a scheme that didn't really fit him. Um, oh no, well, this was Bob Sanders scheme. So then they moved to Dom Capers. That was the scheme that didn't really fit him. Um, you had Johnny Jolly and Ryan Pickett inside. Remember they, had, it's easy to forget Ryan Pickett and Charles Woodson were actually there before Aaron Rodgers was the quarterback. Ryan Pickett, Colin Jenkins. Now Colin Jenkins missed most of 2008 with an injury. Only played four games in that game. And, and this was, when I went back and looked at this, that was something that I had, forgotten but new in real time and it was talked about in real time. I remember it was it was a topic on talk radio a ton at that time. I did not have this podcast in 2008, but it was certainly something being discussed on local radio. Um we did not have Twitter really then, so it wasn't being discussed on Twitter, but the idea that Colin Jenkins was a critical piece to this defense, he was the run defense went from fine to terrible without him in 2008. And then in 2010, Ted Thompson, after the Super Bowl, let Colin Jenkins walk. He played, was healthy the rest of his career, basically, for the next four or five years. Was solid to good in Philly and New York. And the Packers' defense fell off a cliff in 2011. Fell off a cliff. Now, I know Nick Collins got hurt. But Colin Jenkins was low-key, really important to this team. Linebackers, the same. Nick Barnett, A.J. Hawk, Brady Papinga. And the secondary is the same. Charles Woodson, Al Harris, Nick Collins... Atari Bigby. Like the Charles Woodson, Al Harris group is awesome. Tremont Williams is your nickel corner. Charlie Pepra is your backup. So even the backups are mostly the same. It was the same team. And the defense did get a little better. Now the problem was that run defense, they blew a ton of games late, even with guys like Charles Woodson, Al Harris, Nick Barnett, Ryan Pickett. Like they had veterans with sweat equity in the building and they still could not pull these games out late. Defense is highly volatile. Year to year, even game to game, drive to drive even, it is volatile. It's one of the reasons why I kind of don't buy into the Jets this season because I just think that defense is probably going to take a step back. I I think Sauce Gardner is probably not going to be Darrell Revis. Maybe he is. If he is, awesome. But I, like, defense is tough. It's it's not sticky. And so, I just, I wonder about that. Now, for the Packers' purposes here, Aaron Rodgers inherited a 13-3 team again. They went 6-10, but really, it, it wasn't, it wasn't. Because in 2008, they were the 13th overall team by DVOA. How about this for symmetry? In 2022, Aaron Rodgers' last season as starter in Green Bay, the Packers were 12th in DVOA. And just, just, to, just to get fun, 2008, that Packers team, 11th in offensive DVOA, 7th against the pass on defense, 27th against the run on defense. The 2022 Packers, last year's Packers, 11th. Same in offensive DVOA, ninth against the pass, 31st against the run. It is, by the aggregate metrics, the same team. Now, in a lot of ways, not at all the same team, but their productivity cashes out in roughly the same place. Now, how does that 2008 team actually compare to the situation Jordan Love walks into? That is an interesting question, and we're going to talk about that right after this. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now new customers can get a no-sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's $2,500 back in bonus bets if your first bet 
doesn't win. I, I had this uh, circumstance over the weekend. I had a great bet, I thought, for the Memorial. And man, to lose it in a playoff, it's tough. It's tough. But I made the right play. I feel good about it. I don't regret it because I know if I keep making the right plays, it's going to cash out for me and has. I won at the Masters with John Rahm. It's it's fun to win, by the way. Did you know that? But the beauty of this, new customers, that no sweat first bet, you get the bonus bets back. I told you guys last week, my mother-in-law did this. She lost an F1 race. She gets to come back. She gets to bet another F1 race. That's pretty cool. FanDuel lets you do it. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to get that no sweat first bet up to $2,500. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. And thanks for making Locked On Packers your first listen every day. Every day or tomorrow on the show, Joe Marino is here. He's the host of Locked On Bills. He also hosts a great podcast um, with Kyle Krabs, who hosts Locked On Dolphins as well. And it is a terrific conversation about something that they had um, with the Packers. They did every team. They just sort of scouted it because their podcast is from the, the perspective of team building. It's called Locked On NFL Scouting. And so we're going to talk to him tomorrow about an outsider's view on where the Green Bay Packers are. Okay. So when you look at this team, I want to start on defense. The 2008 Packers. Let, 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 let me start here. Jordan Love, I think, inherits more talent at the position. The 20 the 2007 Packers were 16th in DVOA, but a little bit of that was they had Charles Woodson, he was in year 1, they had Nick Collins, they had Al Harris. The front was good, not great. KGB was still on those teams. They just got Justin Harrell, although he was not much. They had a pretty deep defensive front, but like Aaron Campman wasn't really that guy anymore. Though he's still a good player. Linebackers were fine. Brady Papinga, now I think more famous as a Twitter personality than he ever was as a player. Atari Bigby, a big question at safety. Obviously, Nick Collins better than any safety the Packers have on their defense. But when I look at the field tilters in Green Bay, with Rashawn Gary, with Preston Smith, with Lucas Van Ness, on the edge, I feel like the edge rush is more explosive than that team was and Bob Sanders liked to dial up some pressure. They were able to get blitzes, they were able to get home. That's just not the Joe Barry style. But I think Rashawn Gary, when he gets back, whenever that is, is the best pass rusher on either of these defenses. I think Kenny Clark is better than any of these interior defensive linemen. And Preston Smith, probably the best or second best pass rusher on that 2008 team. Then you add in Lucas Van Ness. You add in Kingsley and Ibarre. You add in Justin Hollins. I just think it's better there. And then they don't have the, the sort of, um, you know, that, that, that beef up front. They don't have the John Jolly. They don't have the Colin Cole, the Ryan Pickett, those, those run stuffers. But it's a different game. And by the way, even with those guys, they were terrible against the run. Part of that was the linebacker play. I think Devondre Campbell... Better than any linebacker on any of these teams. All due respect to Nick Barnett and A.J. Hawk in particular. Who were solid players for a long time. Were really fun players to watch. And in their own ways, frustrating players to watch. Because it always felt like talent-wise, they were in one place. And productivity-wise, they weren't quite at that place. Now, whenever you're in the league for as long as they were, they had to be doing something right. But I think Devondre Campbell, I mean, he's an all-pro. Just no one on on that team was to the level that DeAndre Campbell was. And Quay Walker, you know, I would say somewhat similar in terms of what you were looking for early on in their careers with A.J. Hawk, who was, you know, an off-ball linebacker. It's different, but they're both stack linebackers. A.J. Hawk was supposed to be that sort of flow linebacker who could run and chase, who could play in coverage, do a little bit of everything. And he actually turned out to be better moving forward, which is interesting, but... I think Quay Walker also turns out to be better moving forward. There's some similarities there, but A.J. Hawk certainly better in 2008 than we've ever seen Quay Walker be because it's just one year. Could Quay Walker be better right now? 
than than AJ Hawk ever was. Yeah, he could be, but we we haven't seen it. He could be though. He could be. But that's a question. The corner room, I think it's it's pretty close. Russell Douglas and is is the spirit of Al Harris with the trash talk and the physicality. I just I love what both those guys bring. Jair Alexander, you know, not quite on the level of a Charles Woodson. This is Charles Woodson at his absolute apex prime. Um, 2009, he wins Defensive Player of the Year. So this is when he's really starting to assert himself again as one of the dominant players in the league. But Jair Alexander is not far behind. And then you have those secondary guys. Tremont Williams, early in his career. Eric Stokes, early in his career. Extremely talented. So defensively, and, and I read you the stats, almost the exact same team in 2008 as the Packers were last year. And I think that team got better. I really do. I think they got better. They're they're more talented. Now, does that mean they're going to put a better product out on the field? That is a question that we don't have a great answer to. But I think talent-wise, talent-wise, this defense, which was not the strength of that team, but they were a top-half group. If the Packers can be that, you give yourself a really good opportunity. The offense is more important. We're going to spend... More time talking about that because there's more interesting things I think to talk about there. And that's what I what I think you really want to know about, which is why I saved it for last. That's why it's called a tease. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. Every day or tomorrow on the show, as I mentioned, Joe Marino is going to be here from Locked On NFL Scouting. Um, that's going to be a fun show. And I want you to check out Locked On Sports today. Go check out The Leap, our newsletter, a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Um, we still have a ton of content coming um, with them. And so, uh, Locked On Sports today, NBA Finals, got our guys, Locked On Nuggets, Locked On Heat, they're they're in the arenas, they're there getting the, the information, they're checking vibes, which we love on the show, all of that is there for you there. Offensively. Offensively. You look at this Packers offensive line in 2008, it's really good. Chad Clifton, Mark Tauscher. Scott Wells, those are really good players. None of them are as good as David Bakhtiari. They're just not. And I like Jason Spitz, fine. I like Darren College, fine. They were okay players. They just aren't as good as Elton Jenkins. Now, John Runyon Jr., Zach Tom, Yash Nyman. I think that those are those are like because those are unknowns you have to you have to be in the conversation there now when you go to something like adjusted line yards the packers were on offense last year first in or second in adjusted line yards they were uh let's see 2 4 6 7th in adjusted sack rate 6th in adjusted sack rate excuse me you go back and look at that 2018 they were not a good running team 19th in adjusted line yards, and 14th in adjusted sack rate. Now, part of that is Aaron Rodgers as a first-time starter. But I also think they just weren't as good. They just weren't as good. This Packers offensive line is better than the one that Aaron Rodgers had in 2008. The run game was was not good in 2008. Now, it ended up being something that was a useful tool for them in 8, in 9. But remember, this was a team in 2010 that was cycling through running backs. And really didn't have that settled in the Aaron Rodgers era until Eddie Lacy came along. And then Eddie Lacy couldn't stay in the league. And then it was Aaron Jones and and Jamal Williams. And they supplemented that with A.J. Dillon. But this was not a good running team. This was a below average run team by, by DVOA. Ryan Grant, who was a really fun player and, and broke off long runs and, and was a great pickup by Ted Thompson... He's not as good as Aaron Jones. And Brandon Jackson was a crucial piece to that 2010 run. He, um, I believe, is a coach now. He's not as good as A.J. Dillon. So offensive line running backs, it is no contest this new team. This 2023 team is just definitely better and I think has more depth. Um, Now, remember, Josh Sitton is on this team, this 2018 team. But has not quite become Josh Sitton yet. 
Um, and the backups, guys like Alan Barber, Tony Maul, like those guys had to play, and those guys were were real bad. They were really bad. Which is weird because Alan Barber left Green Bay and then became a good play, a kind of a, a, at least kind of a good player. Now the tight ends, another interesting one. Donald Lee, fine player. But I'm talking about like Torrey Humphrey. It's not a good tight end group. It's not. Like Corey Hall and John Kuhn, they used a lot of fullback stuff. Those guys are nice players. John Kuhn benefited from a lot of really good offenses to get some Pro Bowl and all pro nods. God, if I saw Mike McCarthy call fullback belly one more time, I was just, I was going to, I was going to be angry. It was not a good situation. And that was, that was long before I had any interaction with John Kuhn on social media or anywhere else. (laughs) Like Luke Musgrave and Tucker Craft and Josiah DeGuara, it's, it is a light years more athletic room, more talented room. We don't know about them as players. And that, I think, is ultimately the biggest difference between the, the situation Jordan Love finds himself in and the one Aaron Rodgers had in 2008. Greg Jennings was a guy already. Donald Driver was like a Packers Hall of Famer by this time. He's a class of 99. He'd been in the league eight years, nine years in 2008. James Jones, young player, he's a class of 2007. So he had been a rookie in 2007. So he's essentially in the same place as someone like Christian Watson or Romeo Dobbs. Trajectory somewhat similar to Romeo Dobbs. And Greg Jennings, 06 draft class. So by the 08 season, that's only year three. It's not that much further along in his development than someone like Christian Watson or Romeo Dobbs. He was just already more established as a player. Because he had the extra year. And then, of course, the difference is Donald Driver. They're veterans. So, yeah, Corey Hall, John Kuhn. Like, we can we can laugh. But those guys are way more established than Luke Musgrave and Tucker Craft. It's just, it's a difference between known versus unknown. So much more talent with Luke Musgrave and Tucker Craft. So much more than Donald Lee and those other guys. Infinitely more talent. But it's not proven yet. This is a very young team. 2008, they had more veteran guys. It's an interesting strategy from the Packers' perspective. Now, when you look at the group that the Packers have now, you add Jaden Reed and Dontavian Wicks and Bo Melton and, you know, Grant Dubose, along with Romeo Dobbs and Samori Toure and Christian Watson. You go, yeah, that's a deep room. It's a nice room. A lot of those guys are probably better than Ruvel Martin. No, you know, obviously no shade at Ruvel Martin, but he was just like a special teams player. He's a wide receiver five. The question is going to be how fast can these guys mature? And I, I always think it's interesting. You know, you look at a team like Minnesota or like Cincinnati or some of these teams where guys have popped right away. And when T. Higgins popped in 2020, He's coming back in 2021. No one was like, they need veterans. No, they had Tyler Moore, but he's coming off injuries. There's question marks there. When Jamar Chase is all pro as a rookie, no one is like, well, that team's pretty young. Like in 2022, they had a second-year player in Jamar Chase leading their offense, a third-year player in T. Higgins. And then Tyler Boyd was their third wide receiver in the slot. Now, those guys proved to to be better than... You know, Jamar Chase, again, all pro. And T. Higgins, at the very least, proved it over more games than Christian Watson. Although I think Christian Watson in the aggregate was better if you just look at his productivity and efficiency. That's the big difference. And we're going to see how much it matters because there's a lot of talent in this room. But I say this all the all the time. We only talk about talent when they haven't done it yet. Or at least we mostly talk about talent when they only, like Aaron Rodgers gets discussed as, you know, the most armed talent ever. Well, why? Well, because he's only got one Super Bowl. So he's not the greatest ever, according to a lot of people as a result. But he was the most talented. And that's why you make that distinction. Well, this room is really talented. 
they have to prove that they're good. And once they show that they're good, you stop saying, oh, this is the most talented group. You say, this is the best group. Or you say, this is one of the best groups. This is a top 10 group. You wouldn't say this is a top 10 talented receiver room, even if it is. And I don't know that it is. I have to sit down and look at it. Certainly they have some talented guys, some guys that I really like, some guys that they got in the draft at at places that I did not think that they would be available. But... That is not proven commodities. And so that is the biggest difference. Now, when you look at the infrastructure, not to get too crazy with that word, offensive line better, running backs and run game better, tight end talent and athleticism way better, like way better. And then it's receiver. The Packers do not have, just do, objectively do not have as good a receiver room right now. Right now, because we haven't seen Jaden Reed play. We haven't seen Samori Touré in an elevated role. We haven't seen Dontavian Wicks or Grant Dubose. Right now, that 2008 receiver room was like a lot better. Like a lot better. Just if just Greg Jennings and Donald Driver. It's a lot better because Donald Driver was a multi-time pro bowler. He's a really good football player. Christian Watson can be, Christian Watson can be the best receiver of either of these rosters. I truly, truly believe that. He definitely can be better than than any of those 2008 guys, and he's definitely the best guy currently. Will that will that hold up? I don't know. Will he reach his potential? I don't know. Greg Jennings did. Donald Driver did. James Jones did. Those guys were already more proven than Christian Watson at this point. Well, with the exception of James Jones, although James Jones showed some flashes. I would say if... Romeo Dobbs had been healthy, we probably would be thinking about him very similarly to James Jones coming off of that 2007 season into 2008. But again, this difference of being wide receiver three behind two proven guys is just so different. So what does that mean schematically? Well, in Mike McCarthy's offense, you better have had the receivers. It was more important to Mike McCarthy to have the receivers than it is for Matt LaFleur to have the receivers in the kind of offense that he wants to run. Things like offensive line, running back, tight end, that's more important. And that is where the Packers have the resources right now, which is why I think you could see a very similar situation this upcoming season where you go, this team is is just as good as it was last year. Because by the way, last year, and I gave you those stats before we went to break, was basically just as good as that 2008 team And both those teams were below 500, which is why I think you can say if the Packers go below 500, but they put up that sort of statistical profile, just gets unlucky in some close games. You're going to say, fine, that's fine. And it's also why if you look at that 2008 team and last year's team, they easily could have been nine, 10 win teams and been in the playoffs if a couple breaks go their their way versus going against them. And I think that's where the Packers are going to find themselves this year. It's going to be the breaks that define the season. And if they get them, they can be they can be a 10-win team. And if they don't, they're going to be a 6-7 win team. That'll be okay because it's not like this was, you know, the 2007 Patriots when Matt Castle goes 11 and 5 with a soft schedule against with those teams. Like that's not exactly what this is. So, it is an interesting conversation. It's why we spend a whole podcast talking about it. I think ultimately This is going to come down to what does the defense give them? Because I think they're going to be able to score some points. They're going to to get to 21, 24 on a regular basis. The run game, the play action, the speed, the the volatility that they can create, the big plays that they can create. it's It's going to come down to what is this defense? Can this defense hold up in the fourth quarter in ways that that 2008 team couldn't? That could ultimately define this season for the Packers and define if the situation is better or worse. All right, back tomorrow with Joe Marino from Locked On NFL Scouting talking about this Packers team the rest of the week. We are working on our um, Aaron Rodgers signature series. We are working on our rookie orientation series. Much more to come. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked On Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked On Packers. And anytime. You want to come hang out with us live on the Locked on Packers YouTube feed. You can do that. Go subscribe on YouTube so you can stay Locked on Packers.